Hey guys, I'm Tom the Tech Chap, and we've now had Microsoft and Sony share loads more juicy details, including the full specs of the Xbox Series X and the PS5. Although I think the biggest surprise is that Vio is still alive. So they're expected to come out in November, but we still don't know how much they're going to cost, although I'll speculate at the end. But for now, really we've just been given the techie side of things, without a great deal of gameplay. And in the case of Sony, we still haven't even seen the console or the controller, which is a bit disappointing, as Microsoft have bared all for the Series X. Okay, let's start with the specs, and here they are side by side. And fundamentally, they're based on very similar hardware. Custom 8-core AMD Zen 2 processors, AMD RDNA 2.0 graphics, 16 gigabytes of super-fast GDDR6 RAM, and custom SSDs, which I reckon will be the most significant upgrade in real terms over last-gen consoles. What I think is really exciting though is usually with consoles they're just playing catch up to PCs and they're kind of outdated before they even come out, but that's not the case here. With the GDDR6 RAM, PCIe 4 storage, the RDNA 2 graphics, and all the custom hardware and software, it's all cutting edge or not even available in the PC market just yet. And actually, if you were to try to build an equivalent desktop PC, it would cost you at least £1,500, and as I say, some of the tech is just not available yet. Although, let me know in the comments if you would like to see a video all about how the consoles compared to PCs and whether you could actually build a PC. Do let me know and I'll try and make that in the next week. So on paper, the Xbox does appear to be a bit more powerful than the PS5, with higher teraflops, more compute units, and faster processor speeds. However, the PS5's graphics card has a higher clock speed and we get a much faster SSD. A word of warning though, because specs don't tell us the whole story. Let's take the PS5 versus the PS4 for example. This is going to get a little bit techy for a second, but the custom RDNA 2 graphics chip in the PS5 has 36 compute units which run at a max 2.23 GHz. That gives us 10.28 teraflops of peak compute performance. The transistor density of the new graphics is 62% higher than the PS4. So the PS5's 36 CUs is actually equivalent to 58 on the PS4. And on top of that, the PS5s are running at over twice the frequency, so altogether that is a big boost in performance. But it also goes to show how you do have to be careful when you're just looking at the specs on paper. Not all teraflops are made equal, and Sony in particular are trying to be more intelligent with developer features like Kraken for compressing data, a new geometry engine for better optimization, and how fewer but faster compute units than the Xbox Series X may actually end up working better in games. On a very high level, if we just look at graphics performance, the PS5 looks similar to that of the NVIDIA RTX 2080, whereas the Xbox Series X is a little closer to the 2080 Super. But I think a better comparison will be with AMD's next-gen RDNA desktop cards, which will be coming out later in the year. Now, interestingly, Sony and Microsoft do slightly different things when it comes to the processor. Uh, with Microsoft, they let developers choose between having either a 3.66 GHz clock speed, but that then lets them use multi-threading if they want the game to support it, or a slightly higher 3.8 GHz clock speed without multi-threading. But it always maintains that same frequency, whereas on the Sony, it actually caps at 3.55 GHz, but it is a variable frequency. You can go up and down, uh, but while maintaining the same power draw. It doesn't really make any difference to you and me, but it will be interesting to see how that affects developers. Now, when it comes to RAM, while both have 16 GB of cutting-edge GDDR6 RAM, the setup is a little bit different. You can see the Xbox has a bigger 320-bit interface, but the RAM is split. 10 gigs is much faster for games, and 6 gigs is a little bit slower for the UI and background stuff. The truth is, until I have them right here with me, side-by-side uh, side like I do with the current-gen consoles, it's all sort of speculation. On paper, the Xbox does appear to be a little bit more powerful, but as always with consoles, except for exclusive games, generally developers optimize their games for the lesser powerful models, so you know it will run well on both. So I don't think it's really going to matter that much. And regardless if one console is a few percent faster than the other, the bottom line is the performance boost means we'll get much better looking games. Features we've only seen on high-end PCs like ray tracing for more realistic lighting, shadows and reflections, and of course higher resolutions and refresh rates. Both consoles through the new HDMI 2.1 port will support games up to 4K at 120Hz and technically even 8K, although the game itself and your TV will also need to support them. The performance target for both is 4K60 on the vast majority of games though. But by far, the biggest upgrade with the new consoles is the jump from slow old hard drives to super fast SSDs or solid state drives. Silent, no spinning disks, and up to 100 times faster. Now they both use custom SSDs using the brand new PCIe 4 standard. But it looks like, contrary to the early rumors, the PS5's SSD will actually be around twice as fast as the Xbox Series X. 
Sony may have a real advantage here. But still, compared to the 50 to 100 megabytes per second on the PS4, and the fact we now get instant seek times versus between 2 and 50 milliseconds before, altogether Sony say the PS5's I.O. will be 100 times faster than the PS4. It's a similar story on the Xbox Series X, albeit with slightly slower speeds, but make no mistake, this is a revolutionary upgrade uh, for these next-gen consoles. And while we have had SSDs on PCs for donkey's years now, what we're getting in the consoles is actually way more advanced than pretty much anything you can buy right now. For example, both consoles will offer expandable storage. Microsoft will sell one terabyte expansion cards, prices TBC, which look a lot like old memory cards, and then easily slot into the new port on the back of the Series X. On the PS5, it's not as simple. You'll need to buy a certified third-party M2 SSD that is at least as fast as the internal SSD, so games perform as they should, but ideally faster as it won't have some of the custom hardware. Basically, it's unlikely that any SSD on the market right now will work, but by the end of the year, we may have a couple of options. Now, price is going to be a big factor. We don't know how much Microsoft's expansion card or these third-party M2 SSDs are going to cost, probably quite a lot to be honest. Although at this stage, with Microsoft's extra 150 gigs or so internally, and the fact that you can then just buy this additional one terabyte card from them and just pop it in the back and you're good to go, does seem like the more simple and streamlined option. So what does that all mean? Well, ultra fast boot times, almost instant game loading, quick resume between different games, more developer freedom when it comes to level design and movement speeds, faster patch installs, the benefits are endless. Now, both Sony and Microsoft are putting a lot of effort into backwards compatibility, but at this stage, it does seem like Microsoft is promising more, with the OG Xbox, Xbox 360, and Xbox One compatibility on the Series X. Plus, they've talked about upscaling the resolution, frame rate, and potentially even adding proper HDR, even to original Xbox games. Sony hasn't said as much yet, but they have said that current backwards compatible PS3 games will work, as well as almost all PS4 games. Both consoles are also pushing next-gen 3D audio, focusing on more immersive sound without the need for, say, expensive Dolby Atmos speakers. Before this, audio always seemed like an afterthought for new consoles, and I can't wait to try it. So that's just a quick look at all the specs, but Sony are promising a full teardown of the PS5 soon so we can compare the design, the cooling, the controllers, and hopefully see more real next-gen games. I mean, that's what it's all about, really, not just picking through all the tech specs, although that is exactly what we've just done in this video, but of course, it's about the games. As always, though, when it comes to the question of which is best, which one should you buy, it doesn't really matter what the teraflops and the raw specs are, as long as they're roughly comparable. Yes, maybe uh, if you're going to spend £500 or so, you do want the most powerful one that is important, but really it comes down to the exclusive games, uh, which is best value for money, and also which one your mates play on so you can play with them online. But the good news is, while this year kind of sucks right now, I think we all know why, at least we do have two great consoles coming out, probably in November, that we can look forward to, and I can't wait to see what developers do with all that extra hardware and those crazy fast SSDs. But let me know which one you're more excited for by voting in the poll at the top right, and also let me know why in the comments below, and also how much you reckon the consoles will be. I'm just speculating, but I'm thinking probably $500 for the PS5 and maybe $550 for the Xbox, but anything more than that, I think they're gonna really struggle, but then again, if you do compare it to a similarly spec PC, you'd probably be paying three or four times as much. So even if they do end up being a little bit pricey, relatively, maybe it's pretty good value. Thanks for watching, guys. Stay safe, and I'll see you next time right here on The Tech Chat.